Hello, everyone. Welcome to our show, Looking to the East. Very happy to be engaged with you on uh, an unfortunate topic that we focused on for this week, and that's the recent assassination of Shinzo Abe in Japan. I've asked Jay, everybody knows Jay, uh, to help me with this particular webcast. Um, this is a format that we used when I first started doing this uh, webcast, oh, maybe a, a year or so ago now. So um, would like Jay for you to go ahead and take the driver's uh, wheel here and let's go ahead and get started on this, uh, this webcast and on this topic. Yeah. Well, a few days ago, Shinzo Abe, Shinzo Abe was assassinated, which is really interesting because the American perception of life in Japan is it's, it's, it's no violence, no guns, nothing like this. This was completely out of the blue. And um, it, was a, it was a horrible story, like something like the story of uh, Abe Lincoln's assassination, you know? Mm. If he's still alive, you hope he'll pull through, the doctors are working, and then by, by a few hours later, he's gone. Um, tragic, tragic because of his uh, achievements as a as a political figure in Japan and what he did for Japan. Over right. The years we were we were all shocked. We were shocked on a number of levels. Assassinations are shocking by by definition, but shocking in Japan even more, and and shock shocking in the world order somehow for a country that is uh, you know nonviolent. All of a sudden we have violence, um, and we're close with Japan, which makes it you know all the more shocking. And you've been in Japan for decades, and uh, you can appreciate so many uh, issues and angles around this. And you can help us understand what this, what this, what happened, and what this means um, to Japan, to the relationship between Japan and the U.S., and to the world order. I would say. Right. So, Steve, uh, your thoughts, please. Yes. I, yeah. I think Jay, you've you've captured the initial response that was also evident in the country of Japan as well. Um, I'm sure you and many of the viewers have saw statistics on gun violence in Japan versus the United States. On an annual basis, the number of deaths by guns is usually less than 10. And I'm talking about for the entire year, as opposed to the United States, uh, which has a very strongly developed gun culture, um, as everyone knows, and the deaths Per year are in the 30 to 40,000 range. So the fact that this occurred through the use of a gun, uh, an improvised gun, one that the assassin actually created himself, uh, made this story uh, particularly shocking. So that's one aspect, that it was a gun. It wasn't a sword. It wasn't a knife. There are occasional outbreaks of um, terrorism, violence, and uh, but usually it involves swords are nice. And the reasons for that is that gun control in Japan is unbelievably strict. Basically, unless you're a policeman, uh, you don't have access to a gun. There is hunting in the country, uh, but the regulations, the application, the interviews directly with the police force, uh, the requirements for holding the gun are just so incredibly difficult and strict that in essence, you never see a gun or you don't read about gun violence in the United States. So that was one aspect. The other aspect- well, Can I interrupt is, you? Yes, go, of course. What, what, you know, uh, we, we have a strong cultural connection with Japan and that includes entertainment. And one of the problems in the American culture is our entertainment includes um, gunfights all the time. It's the OK mm. Corral every day. Right. Um, thousands of shots being fired and hundreds of people being killed every night on an ordinary night of TV movies. Mm -hmm. uh, do those movies, do that entertainment reach Japan? Does of it have course. any effect on Japan? Of course. Yeah, American media, American um, cultural artifacts, those types of things are very, very popular in Japan. So on any given night, uh, there's a Rambo movie or you know, one of those violence-oriented movies. So Japan is exposed to violence all the time in popular media. Guns themselves uh, are popular, but they are popular in, in the sense that people study about them. They don't acquire them and they don't use them unless it's on a very limited basis. So that was one aspect. The other aspect is the political assassination, which in Japan uh, is also extremely rare. 
The last time a major assassination of a national figure occurred was in 1960. So people who were born you know, in that period have never experienced a political assassination of this type in Japan. So the, the fact that it was done by a gun, a homemade gun, and the fact that it was a, a political assassination just really shocked Japan. And uh, frankly, I think even now, a week or so later, they're still trying to figure out what exactly happened. Why did this guy do that? And what are the ramifications going to be? So for those, I think most Americans or most viewers uh, are probably somewhat familiar with Abe because he was the prime minister uh, for uh, a number of years. In fact, he was the longest serving prime minister ever uh, for the country in two different stints. Basically, he was a pretty right-leaning politician, came from a very uh, wealthy family that had political, political lineage. Um, his grandfather was a prime minister before World War II. So often in Japan, uh, these political figures are in politics because their father or their grandfather or their great uncle um, was in politics as well. So it becomes somewhat of family business and Abe certainly fell into that category. He is what, when I was doing the research for this, what some political scientists considered to be a socio-cultural politician. Um, he was very aware of how culture and politics mix. So he was able to pick items or issues uh, to use to promote his party and also himself. Um, he was also uh, very aware of the power of media and how important that is in terms of persuading people to vote one way or the other. So one example of this is uh, slickness when it comes to political issues is that there's an, uh, there was a kidnapping that occurred by North Korean government agents of Japanese citizens back in the 1970s. It's the abduction issue. Uh, it, it surfaces every once in a while. In fact, even Biden has addressed this recently. Uh, saying that it's something that we need to solve. But this has occurred in the 1970s. But when Abe became prime minister the first time, he picked this as his signature issue. You know, we have to fix this problem. We have to get North Korea to return these Japanese citizens. Now, in the scope of things, it, it was really not a major issue, but he was able to use it as a political trump card. And that is the issue that helped to make him the prime minister the first time. Uh, which was in 2006. He was prime minister for one year, uh, didn't do very well. He ended up uh, quitting, but then came back later in 2012. And that's when he served for this longer period of time. So just in summary, he comes from a very politically successful family with history of his ancestors being in the prime minister role or other government roles. And uh, he used the media and pol social cultural issues uh, to uh, create uh, an image of himself and his, of his party that was very, very successful and was able to make sure that his party stayed in power uh, during the time that he was the prime minister. In fact, his party has been in power for almost the entire time since World War II. Uh, Japan, in that respect, is a one-party state, actually. It's a little bit like the Communist Party, although when I talk about that with Japanese people, they don't want to think about Japan and China being similar. But uh, and, and there are, of course, huge differences. But the fact that the Abe's party, which is called the Jiminto, or the Liberal Democratic Party, has been in power since World War II pretty much consistently all the way through. It's quite, quite uh, amazing. And his popularity must have something to do with that. Yeah, he, um, um, his first stint as a prime minister, I think people perceived him as being ineffective. Uh, and he ended up resigning after many scandals for health reasons. But uh, his consolidation of power within the party continued even beyond that one year um, disappointing episode. So he was able to uh, establish power in the party so that he had an opportunity once again to become the leader of the Jiminto or the Liberal Democratic Party. And therefore, because that party always wins the highest number of seats in the Diet, which is the Congress, he became prime minister again. And uh, overall, uh, because of the utilization of 
the media and these political issues like the abduction issue, he was able to maintain popularity through the course of his prime ministership. Uh, there, were, there were scandals and many issues and some of his legislation was not all that popular, but overall, <clears throat> even prior to his assassination, uh, he was perceived as being quite effective and he was quite popular. But now, Jay, the big question is, he's gone, right? So what happens next? Even though he's not the prime minister, I'm sorry, he wasn't the, the prime minister when he was assassinated, he was still the most important politician in the country. Mm -hmm. So the current prime minister, his name is Kishida, uh, comes from the same party, naturally. As I mentioned, that party has been in power for all of these decades. But the real power broker, and this is how Japanese politics works, it's not the guy who's in the front, necessarily who is the one who's actually driving the levers of government. It's people who are in the background who may no longer be the prime minister. And that certainly was Abe. So Abe was a head of the largest faction group within the Liberal Democratic Party. And he pretty much can veto any initiative that Prime Minister Shida uh, would want to put forward. He really was the one who was the most powerful person. This is another reason why it's so incredibly shocking. Even though he was not the prime minister, he was still the most important politician in the country. And well, probably would have been for another 10 into, or 15 years. That had a play into the uh, assassins uh, targeting him, yeah? The assassin might have gone through the same analysis. Um, there, the, the police are, are releasing interview information slowly. Uh, about the assassin himself. He's a middle-aged, uh, unemployed guy who had served some time in the Japanese military, which is unusual because the Japanese military, like in America, it's voluntary. Uh, but the primary motivation, at least to this point, for the assassination seems to not be political. It seems to be more having to do with religion. So this is still somewhat... Um, tentative, but this the assassin's mother was a part of the Mooney's organization. I don't know if this is getting reported in the United States, but it's coming out slowly in Japan. And uh, the this, this son saw his mother give the bulk of her wealth to that religious organization. In his view, basically, they were ripping him, ripping her off, right? And as in the United States, these far right religious organizations like the Moonies, you know, they own the Washington Times, for example, and they advocate for political, politically conservative issues all the time. That's true also in Japan. So there has been somewhat of a symbiotic relationship between the Jiminto, the Liberal Democratic Party, and Abe in particular, and the Moonies organization, which kind of funds right wing initiatives and so forth. So just recently, Abe appeared in a video supporting the Mooney's organization in Japan. So that seems to be the motivation of the assassin, at least as far as we can tell so far. He's not talking. Um, well, he is, but the police are slowly rele uh, revealing this information. Uh, he see, uh, you know, it's hard to tell exactly because you read this in the, the mainstream press and then pick up other hints of this in the alternative press. But he seems to be fairly open about what he did. They searched his home. Uh, they have all of his uh, records, uh, electronic records, and they had uh, other guns that he was, he was making that were in his apartment. And he was also apparently trying to build a bomb as well, but he ended up using this makeshift, it's called a shotgun actually, to assassinate Abe. One other issue, Jay, that's coming up is, is how did this happen? How could someone with a, a, a do-it-yourself gun be able to get so close to the prime minister and be able to shoot not just once, but twice without the Japanese equivalent of the Secret Service being able to prevent this from happening? So I think because political violence, this type of stuff is so unusual, um, maybe the Secret Service protocols were not as strict as what you see certainly in the United States, where this is a, you know, this is a, a, a fact that someone could take a shot at the president on any given day. 
Um, so that's an issue that's going to be addressed. And maybe the way that politicians go out into the public, this is their style. They go to train stations. I mean, everybody sees this during the election period. They're standing out in the open uh, and security. When I've watched this in downtown Kobe, you really don't see those guys. I'm sure they're there, but I, they're not in front. There's no glass protection, for example. So that's an issue too that's uh, surfaced since the assassination. Well, uh, aside from security, what other implications uh, for change uh, does this uh, raise uh, in Japan politics and in you know in the, the dynamic of the country? It yeah. certainly changes. It changes the view of people from the outside about whether Japan would include violence and assassination. But what about inside? Yeah, I, uh, it's, it's a little hard to tell since we're so um, close to when the <clears throat> assassination actually occurred. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> these things, again, are so rare that I think over time, um, people will maybe not think about it in, in such a dramatic sense as it's being thought about right now in terms of political violence and the use of, of guns. I don't think that the Japan society will change. When gun regulation is already as strict as it could possibly be, uh, this guy did not buy a gun. He actually made a gun. Maybe there'll be some effort to try and prevent whatever components he used uh, to build a gun from being sold so easily that apparently anybody can put together a gun in Japan with these basic components. The big thing about the ramifications is this occurred uh, on Friday and there was a national election on Sunday, right? So Abe was assassinated as the de facto leader of the Liberal Democratic Party. Now the Liberal Democratic Party was favored to win in a pretty strong fashion in the election. Uh, it, the diet in Japan, the Congress equivalent has two components. It's a little bit like the house. There's a lower house. <clears throat> which is the most important component of the diet. And then there's an upper house, which I guess you can think of as kind of the Senate. It's a parliamentary system that, that they have in Japan. So on Sunday, this upper house election occurred. And it's very clear from the results because the uh, Liberal Democratic Party actually did better than what the initial forecasts were for the election. Everyone knew they were gonna win, but they won by even more numbers. And the, uh, the opposition party lost by more than what they expected to lose. So there was a sympathy vote, Jay, that occurred. You know, it's quite remarkable. It occurred on Friday and the vote was on Sunday, but many people apparently switched their vote to the Liberal Democratic Party kind of as a sense of uh, honor or uh, respect <clears throat> for Abe and the fact that this terrible thing happened to him as the leader of the Jiminto Party. So I think that's one of the major ramifications, and we've seen that in the election results. Can we talk about the criminal justice system? You said there were strict controls on guns, and Absolutely. I guess that would mean criminal penalties if uh, you, you have a gun uh, or use a gun. Um, but there's also you know, the matter of uh, assassination and murder. And I wonder how that works ordinarily, uh, how it's going to work in this case, and whether there will be changes to make the sanctions all the more um, you know, strict. Mm. The, uh, my observation, I'm certainly not an expert in this area, but I, as you mentioned, I've been in Japan a long time. Uh, you know, in 1995, uh, there was the disaster of um, this strange religious sect, the Alm group. I don't know if you remember that, Jay, in 1995. They uh, put together uh, toxic gases and they allowed them to spread in the subway systems in Tokyo, and several people died, and many, many people were injured. Now, the guy who was responsible for that, the leader of that religious sect, um, just recently, if I rec rec uh, uh, recall correctly, was, was killed by the state. He, he experienced the death penalty, but it took over 20 years uh, for that to actually occur. So this individual will go through the Japanese legal system, which will move very, very, very slowly. But at some point, my guess would be that he would be put to death because in Japan, there is the death penalty. It's not used all that often, but it is an option. 
uh, for the government to uh, request. And I think in this case, it will probably occur. You know, I'm reminded of our conversation, you and me, uh, I guess a few months ago, about this corporate executive. I think his first name was Carlos. Yeah, um, Carlos Gomes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was put in jail by the Japanese authorities and he somehow escaped. Yes, uh, and, yeah, and after he did. And after he escaped, he, uh, he told the story of how tough and rough it was in jail. So yeah. what is it? What is it like for this fellow to be in jail, pending you know the ultimate outcome of the charges against him? I think, given the profile of this case, he will be in solitary confinement for the entire period, and he would not be put into the general population because someone would probably kill him uh, in there. So I'm again, I'm not an expert in this area, but to for his own protection and the fact that they. They don't want him to be prematurely killed. You know, they're going to try and find out as much information from him as possible and show the Japanese people that justice is being served in this murder and this assassination. So that in the end, it's not some random inmate that kills him. It's going to be the state that does it. You think, uh, as in the, the select committee in Congress, there'll be a public investigation or even you know a, a, an intelligence investigation on his connection with others, with organizations, uh, whether there was anybody else involved in right. conspiring with him or uh, uh, you know somehow uh, encouraging him. I'm sure they're looking at his uh, his computer files and the records in his apartment uh, for exactly that, and if anybody else is implement uh, is. Um, implicated in this. One, one thing that did, did come up, Jay, is that, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting thing about Japanese law. It's a reflection of the sense of community that Japan has, the um, collective nature of the culture. And, you know, there's a big difference in terms of how Japanese people collaborate with each other. And there's many benefits of that, uh, as opposed to the United States, where we, we tend to operate more independently from each other, relatively speaking. But one of the aspects where this surfaces is in court cases. So there are instances where uh, individuals create uh, or carry out a crime. Like for example, um, there's a driver and um, he has certain medical problems uh, and has actually lied about uh, those problems in order to get his driver's license, for example, he's epileptic, right? And if you're epileptic, you can only get a driver's license if your doctor would recommend you. So in Kyoto, a number of years ago, someone who was epileptic actually had a seizure while he was driving and he ended up running over, I think it was five or six school children. And he was, convi he was convicted, but his parents were also brought into this because the parents knew that he had a driver's license and that he was epileptic. And therefore, they were in part responsible for this terrible action to occur. So in the case of the assassin, this individual, his parents now are being looked at. You know, how come you didn't know he was going to do this? What was your responsibility in this area? So I think this is being a surface a few times in the States now with some of the gun violence that's occurred with younger, younger people. But in Japan, that, that occurs relatively often. So it may be that his family's brought up and held partially responsible for allowing this to happen when they knew their son may have been thinking about doing this. Mm. In terms of his motivation, um, you know, the first, the first thought that struck me and, and people I know is that uh, somehow um, this was um, uh, sort of a viral reaction to what is going on and publicized from the United States. So if this happens, uh, mass shootings happen 11 times a week on the average in this country that's horrible and query whether you know this guy was operating on some similar kind of cult motivation you know violence is good and i i need to express my political views in violence with guns mm -hmm. and he was a copycat uh, for what happens uh, on on many occasions in the united states uh, and the second part of my question in that regard is do you think this stands alone as a solitary incident or do you think people will copycat in japan after this? Yeah, there's, uh, I, I, in terms of his motivation, I, I, as far as I know, it had to do with this religious issue. Uh, but that's just preliminary information that's slowly being leaked. Uh, whether there was uh, 
he, he was viewing American media or uh, was influenced by violent games and so forth, which seems to be a pattern sometimes we see with the violent crime in the United States. So that hasn't come out yet or not. Um, the police and the government is responding to this with the expectation that there will be copycat crimes occurring. So that's already been uh, in the news and the government's trying to figure out how to prevent that from happening. Uh, for It's a little bit the, the, the closing of the barn door after the horse has left, but right now uh, Abe's residence is completely blanketed by police. So any place where there's any exposure to his family right now, uh, the police are, are you know going way, way, way to the extreme to make sure that someone doesn't go, oh, I can do the same thing maybe, but I can take out a family member or maybe some other politician as well. So that is being um, reflected upon right now, Jay. You know, to the extent that this was uh, the assassination of an important uh, government official uh, mm -hmm. to the minds of some, um, a most, the most well-known popular official mm -hmm. uh, who served many years and, and defined uh, you know, Japan's um, politics for many, many terms and, he did. and decades. Um, there's, there's got to be, um, you know, an implication of an international implication, and that now it seems for now um, there's an open door, a green light, if you will, on assassinations of public officials, and mm. that it won't stop at at um, at Japan, and that a, 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 some sort of violent person in another country might take off after another uh, political official or, or somebody who is a a popular political name in that country too. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the concern about that? I, and I guess that would certainly include the U.S., although you know, the U.S. is so much violence, it almost doesn't matter who you shoot at. Um, but you know, other countries that are otherwise peaceful may, may have a similar experience because it, uh, it, it sounds like um, you know, there's an open door in this possibility. Yeah. Um, I would think maybe uh, various countries in Asia um, because Japan is a leading country, uh, is perceived as being very peaceful, but now this horrible episode has occurred and it was a political assassination. Uh, maybe some of the leaders like in China, Korea, Singapore, Malaysia, other countries are going, wow, if this can happen in Japan, you know, maybe we need to relook at our security procedures. Maybe we need to look at our um, investment in mental health issues uh, to try and prevent this from occurring. So there's probably going to be a ripple effect because Japan is so influential in the Asian uh, region. And uh, the expectation is that this doesn't happen in Japan. And uh, I, if, if I was to think about political disasters and write down a thousand things, this would not be one of them just wouldn't have think, thought of this as occurring in Japan. And lots of other things potentially could happen. But this one was really a great, great surprise. So other countries are probably going, hmm, if this happens in Japan, maybe we need to be careful as well. But to, we're running out of time. But the, the, the really, the, the thing I want to close on is what's going to happen with the LDP now? The fact that Abe is gone, and he was the most powerful person, and he headed the faction that was the largest, that, that's a power vacuum right now that exists within the Japan political area. So how it's going to be filled, what's gonna come out of that, who's gonna take his place? Those are open questions right now. Nobody has the answer to. Um, we'll have to see how it goes. That'll be interesting to follow. Yeah, and interesting to follow. We know it's an inflection point. We don't know the extent it of is. the inflection. And it'd be interesting for you to follow as a, you know somebody who follows everything in Japan. Um, to see how wide and deep that inflection point is and, and what changes uh, under the hood and over the hood um, right. will happen. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Steve yeah, Marker. thank you. Thank you all for, for the viewers of this. Thank you, Jay, for uh, uh, filling in as AMC for the going to our old pattern. Um, I'm working on uh, my next show. It might be the next one or the one after. Um, Jay, you might be interested in this, where uh, Japan as a whole is trying to bring students from Ukraine to study at Japanese universities, because obviously they can't study in their own country now. So my school, Kansai Gaida University, is participating in this program, and I want to set up an interview with the person who originated this program. Uh, we're 
I think probably 20 or 30 Ukrainian students are already in the country and there could be a hundred more starting in the fall. And we're subsidizing their tuition and their, uh, their dorm costs and so forth. So it's uh, kind of a, as opposed to the story today, this is more of a feel good story. I mean, of course, Ukraine's a disaster, but Japan's reaching out to the students and trying to give them a way to complete their studies in Japan and maybe eventually set up a professional life in Japan like I did after I was an exchange student in Japan many, many years ago. So that's what's coming up. That's great, Steve. And it's, it's also a look into the Japanese, the Japanese sensibilities, the Japanese uh, um, philanthropy, if you will. Right. Uh, and I'd be interested to see how that plays out. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.